History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 559th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to be featuring an old haunted hotel, the Lord Baltimore Hotel, and of all places, Baltimore. Very nice. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the spectacular crew, Liz, Shannon, JC, and David. Thank you so much for joining the spectacular crew. And now, this moment, Noddity. The moment in Oddity was suggested by Michael Rogers. In Argentina, there's a most unique island called El Ojo. It is located in the Parana Delta in the Buenos Aires province. The island itself actually floats and is nearly entirely circular in formation. The lake that El Ojo floats within is round as well, and the island rotates on its own axis due to a river that flows beneath it. The island has its edges continually broken off as it rotates around the lake, continuing its perpetual circular shaping. As to how El Ojo came to be is still unknown. The island is uninhabited and roughly 118 meters in diameter. Over time, it will slowly reduce in size due to the erosion of its edges. A strangely circular segment of land spinning within a circular lake resembling an eyeball certainly is odd. Turn out the lights. The party's just getting started. And now, this month in history. This month in history was suggested by Jenny Lynn Raines. In the month of October, on the 14th in 2015, American photographer Bruce Mozart passed away. Mozart was most well known for his exceptional underwater photography. In 1938, Mozart was working on a photo shoot in Miami, Florida. While there, he heard about the filming of a Tarzan movie in Silver Springs near Ocala, Florida. Once Bruce arrived at Silver Springs and he encountered the crystal clear water, he decided to stay. Mozart became Silver Springs' official photographer. Bruce stated of Silver Springs, I saw that crystal clear water and that's how I got into my underwater work. His photographs were very unique. He didn't typically feature fish or other subjects normally found underwater. The majority of his photographs highlighted women underwater doing everyday chores that would routinely be done on land. Tasks like cooking, reading newspapers, mowing lawns, and even archery were featured. The photos are stunning and were used to advertise Silver Springs to tourists and film crews. Over the years, his photographs were published in the Huffington Post, National Geographic, Life, Look, and Smithsonian Magazine. His reproductions of his work can be purchased online through various sites. Even if you have no interest in purchasing any of his pictures, we highly recommend searching his photography to enjoy. Bruce Mozart passed away in his Ocala, Florida home at the age of 98. Viewing historical pictures from the Lord Baltimore Hotel conjures images of the Overlook Hotel and Jack Torrance standing for a photo with a large group of guests. Its heyday came during the glitz and glamour of the 20s and 30s. The hotel has stood for nearly 100 years and hosted several notable people. It also was a scene of several suicides after the stock market crash. And for that reason, despite its historic charm, there are many ghosts hanging around the hotel. Join us for the history and hauntings of the Lord Baltimore Hotel.
Before the city of Baltimore was founded, the Susquehanna tribe was here at what is known as the Potomac Creek Complex. The merchant ship, the Ark, arrived at nearby St. Clement's Island with 140 colonists in 1634. More Europeans followed and settled north of the island, and the city of Baltimore was founded in 1729. The city was named for Cecil Calvert, the second baron Baltimore, and was laid out in 1730. Growth was slow as people were skeptical that the city's port would be an effective place of transport. A man named Dr. John Stevenson shipped his flour over to Ireland successfully from Baltimore, and once other merchants saw this, Baltimore exploded. Official incorporation came in 1796. The War of 1812 put Baltimore in the crosshairs of the British. In 1814, the Battle of Baltimore was fought, and the British were unable to take Baltimore, and they fled. The nation was inspired by the victory, and so was Francis Scott Key, who watched the battle as a captive on board a British warship. He was inspired to write a poem called Defense of Fort McHenry, which became our national anthem. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was America's first railroad and gave the city even more prominence. So many immigrants came through Baltimore's port that it was second only to New York City as a national port of entry. Can you believe that? Very impressive. Little fun fact. Before the Lord Baltimore Hotel was on the site, there was another hotel named Hotel Caswell here. It had opened as a 250-room hotel in 1905. Harry Busick had come to Baltimore from the small town of Still Pond. He got a job as a clerk at the Carrollton Hotel and worked there for a year until it burned to the ground. Busick moved on to University Hospital, and he became very successful. He got a loan from a bank and leased the new Howard Hotel. Within two years, he was managing the Caswell Hotel. With the responsibilities of running two hotels, Busick formed the Union Hotel Company, and under that, he decided to build a super hotel in Baltimore. He bought the Caswell Hotel for $750,000 in 1919, and nine years later, he had it raised. Now he was going to build his dream hotel. Busick hired the renowned architect William Lee Stoddard to design the hotel. Stoddard had designed several hotels up to this point, but the Lord Baltimore would be his finest achievement. Stoddard was famous enough in his time for his divorce from his wife to become a national scandal, covered by the New York Times. In 1908, his wife Mary filed for divorce, citing extreme cruelty and took the couple's three children from New Jersey to Reno, Nevada. Stoddart countersued, accusing Mary of having an affair with an architect friend of his. The New York Times, in National Enquirer fashion, published three personal and intimate letters that Mary had written to Stoddart in which she begged for divorce and financial help. How they got those letters, I have no idea. Stoddart finally agreed to the divorce and sent money. The scandal didn't hurt him that much, as his success with the Lord Baltimore Hotel and other grand hotels reveals. The design features a beau art style with elements of Italian and French Renaissance. This was the last high-rise building in Baltimore with classical ornamentation in the downtown area. The foundation of the hotel was in a U-shape, with two steel and brick towers, capped by an octagonal tower with a granite trim and flat roof that was at the rear or the bottom of the U. There was also a copper-covered mansard on that rear tower with carved stone dormers and large medallions depicting the head of a lion. The copper is now turned a hue of gray-green patina, and it's just a very cool look. Rising to 289 feet, the hotel was the tallest building in all of Maryland at the time. The interior featured elements of Italian Renaissance and large squared piers with Corinthian capitals. A marble stairway led from the 5,300-square-foot lobby to the main dining room that had mirrored transoms and large windows. The lobby was surrounded by a mezzanine and originally had terrazzo marble floors and rose travertine marble walls. There was a banquet hall on the second floor that featured crystal chandeliers and room for over 1,200 people. There were also meeting rooms on this level. Like many hotels of the time, the ground level featured stores. The Lord Baltimore Hotel opened in the winter of 1928 with 700 rooms. Today, it's like down to, I think, 420. So these were probably pretty small rooms, I'm thinking. Many in the city attended its opening gala, including Governor Albert Ritchie, Baltimore Mayor William F. Browning, and even some relatives of the Royal Baltimore family. This was such a big affair that a local radio station broadcast the opening live. And speaking of radios... One of the amenities that was included in all of the rooms that was like, wow, a big deal for its time, were radios. How cool. 
There was a two-story speakeasy hidden away in the hotel that was remodeled into a storage closet in 1933 after Prohibition was over. They lost it somehow, and they rediscovered it in 2013. Harry Busick died shortly after the hotel opened when he drowned in 1930. So basically two years after he opens his dream hotel, he's dead. I don't know all of the specifics around it, but what I did find was a New York Times headline that read, Harry Busick of Baltimore found dead near ducking blind. So he basically accidentally drowned while he was hunting, I'm thinking. His sons Nelson, Howard, and Morton took over managing the hotel and it flourished. Even though the Great Depression and World War II impacted the economy, the hotel managed to do well because of the superior service, design, and amenities. In the 1940s, the hotel underwent a redecoration program. The Calvert Ballroom received a collection of historic murals done by Baltimore artists Mabel and John Georgie. One of the murals shows a view of Baltimore in the 19th century, looking south from the Washington Monument, and another shows street scenes of Baltimore during the 19th century. During the early years of the hotel, it was segregated as ordered by local ordinances, so no blacks were allowed inside. By 1958, the Busick brothers were done with those ordinances, and they opened the hotel to everyone. And so that year, three baseball greats, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and Frank Robinson, were able to stay at the Lord Baltimore when they played in the All-Star Game hosted by Baltimore. Ten years later, Martin Luther King Jr. stayed while attending the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Dr. King was given the keys to the city by the mayor, Tommy De Alessandro III, at the hotel. That's Nancy Pelosi's brother. Yeah, little fun <laughs> fact there. <laughs> Some other fun facts here. Another notable person who was here at the hotel and stayed here was Amelia Earhart. And they had like some big dinner shindig for her. And so it was hosted here at the hotel. And while I was reading about that, the article I was reading wanted to talk a little bit more about Earhart and some of the things she did. And she would do these fancy dinners every so often. And one of them was with Eleanor Roosevelt. You can imagine Amelia Earhart is in this fancy dress or what have you gown for the evening. She's got her gown slippers to go with it. And she leans over to Eleanor Roosevelt and is like, hey, you want to ditch this place? (laughs) Why don't we go fly a plane? Would you like to go for a a little flight with me? Oh, how cool is that? So they get in the plane and they're flying and you've got Amelia Earhart wearing her gown. And of course, Eleanor Roosevelt, same thing with her slippers. And some people may not know, but Eleanor Roosevelt was actually a student in a flight school at the same time. So she took over the controls for a little bit. And so they're flying around in this plane. Both of these women all dressed to the nines. How fun. I love it. So I thought that was a really cool story. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. The Busick brothers decided to sell the hotel in 1960 to a New Yorker named Weisberg for $7.1 million. The Lord Baltimore went through several owners after that, and it started to deteriorate. The Baltimore downtown had an economic downturn as well, and business wasn't going well for the hotel. It struggled until a company named Federated Enterprises, Inc. bought it at an auction in 1969 and began an extensive renovation. This was an inspired effort, but didn't work, and the hotel closed in 1982. This was after the hotel had suffered three suspicious fires as well. I don't know if it was supposed to be some kind of insurance fraud because they said they were suspicious. This hotel during this period here in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s is going through all these different hands. You'd get somebody would buy it and then they would default. And so that's why it would be like up for auction again. So nobody seemed to be able to like buy the hotel and make it make money. In 1992, Universal Equities partnered with Radisson Hotels and they reopened the hotel as the Radisson Plaza Lord Baltimore. The building was renovated further and brought back to its former glory. Hilton bought the property in 1997. In 2013, the Rubell family bought the hotel and ended the relationship with Radisson so they could operate it independently. The family proceeded to invest millions into the building. Under their management, the Lord Baltimore has flourished and won numerous awards. With over 20 documented cases of suicide by jumping from the roof of the hotel, It's no wonder rumors persist that the hotel is haunted. Suzanne C. Kugel Davier writes the Baltimore Through My Eyes blog, and she shares, With elevator access to what is now the LB Sky Bar, an outdoor space on the 19th floor, jumpers would have found it very easy to make their way to the edge of the roof. 
After my grandfather began working there as the night auditor, per my grandmother, one of the jumpers actually landed on the hood of his brand new car, completely destroying it. Can you imagine? What a horrible family story to have. Not one I would want. The Lord Baltimore has ended up on many top 10 haunted hotel lists and participated in the world's largest ghost hunt for several years. I think they started at least definitely back in 2018, and they did it all the way up into this last month here in September of 2024. A woman and a man are heard quarreling on the mezzanine when no one is visibly seen. The elevator seems to have a mind of its own at times, and the 19th floor seems to be the most haunted. And this is where the elevator, if it's doing its own thing, it goes all the way up to the 19th floor on its own. Guests claim to feel a presence in their rooms, and some claim to be touched while near or on the elevator. The spirit of a little girl wearing a cream-colored dress and black shoes with a red ball that the staff call Molly has been seen in the ballroom and on the 19th floor. Guests have complained to the front desk about a young girl bouncing a ball, keeping them awake. You could just imagine their phone up the front desk and there's like, where is this child's parents? She's like (laughs) running up and down the hallway and bouncing this ball and I'm trying to sleep. The story behind her is it's a horrible story. This is very tragic if it's true. But this is what they say that her parents, they lost all their money when the stock market crashed. So they decided they were going to jump from the roof of the hotel and they took her with them. Oh, my word. A ghostly couple seen dancing in the ballroom is said to be her parents, but some investigators disagree and say the couple definitely don't like to be disturbed. So this could be some other couple that are dancing on the floor. WJZ in Baltimore has a segment called Where's Marty? And last year for Halloween, he was at the Lord Baltimore. They had several things happen that they couldn't explain. During the intro, a wall sconce started blinking for no apparent reason. A little red ball that was used as a trigger object rolled all by itself. The camera guy, who was named K2, I mean, how perfect, (laughs) and he's on a ghost hunt, told viewers that the battery in his camera completely died. WBAL TV 11 reported from the hotel this year, 2024, in September for National Ghost Hunting Day. They caught a figure on the SLS camera. Reporter Tori Yorgi told viewers that a tripwire on the floor had been flickering for several minutes and a K2 she was holding kept pinging as well. And it's so funny because she was like holding it up to the camera while she was talking about something else. And it was kind of like she was just waving it around while she was moving her hand around like she was talking. And it's like pinging up to yellow. And I'm like, it's going right now. (laughs) She didn't even notice it. And she clearly was afraid of stuff actually happening. She was she was just like, I'm ready to get out of here. And I'm like, (laughs) okay. And there was lots of things. There was like a music box that kept going off and stuff. So every time stuff would go off, like the tripwire, one of the lights would just turn blue and she'd be like, ah, I'm like, this girl should not go ghost hunting with you and I. Like (laughs) if we had her at the Dixie house. (laughs) Oh, my. She'd last like a minute and be out the door. The hotel has this account from a former employee named Fran Carter. In 1998, Fran was on the 19th floor of the building preparing a small meeting room for future use. She was working at a table facing the wall with an open door to her left. She bent over the table for a few moments, absorbed in her work. Then she looked up and to her left at the doorway. A little girl wearing a long cream-colored dress and black shiny shoes ran by the open doorway, bouncing a red ball before her. Fran immediately ran outside, calling after her, Little girl, are you lost? The hallway was completely empty. Fran, quite shaken at this point, turned around to go back to the meeting room when she saw two people walking down the hallway toward her. The first was an older gentleman dressed in formal attire. He was accompanied by a woman in a long ball gown. Fran asked them if they were looking for their granddaughter because she had just run by. She turned to point in the direction the child had passed. When she turned her head back toward the two people, they just vanished right before her eyes. Fran was then so frightened that she called a security guard. He stayed there with her until she finished her work and no more ghostly visitors appeared on the 19th floor that evening. A few years later, a guest at the hotel told Fran that she believed that her room had a ghostly visitor. She was awakened in the middle of the night by the sound of a child crying. As she sat up in her bed, she saw a little girl crying and rocking herself back and forth while sitting in the window of her room. As the woman rose to go to the girl, she slowly faded away. The little girl was wearing a long, cream-colored dress with black shoes. One evening, a few years later, Fran was approached by a co-worker who told her that three people were standing in the dark in the ballroom of the hotel. The hotel's ballroom is a very large room, which can accommodate 1,250 people seated at banquet tables. Three arch ceiling-length windows dominate the far wall of the room. 
the side of the room opposite the entrance doorway. When Fran entered the ballroom, she walked across the room in the direction of the windows. She noticed that there were indeed three people standing there in the darkened, moonlit room. One man stood before the far left window, another stood before the far right window, and a woman stood a few feet behind the men before the middle window. They were all looking upward through the windows. Fran noticed that one was wearing a dark, possibly blue sport blazer with metallic buttons that gleamed in the darkness. He had an ascot tied around his throat and appeared quite the dapper gentleman. She thought that his clothing was odd, but at this point didn't know that her visitors were out of the ordinary. She then asked them if they would come. She then asked them if they would like some light and walked by the man in the ascot to turn on the light switch just a few feet from where he was standing. Light immediately flooded the room and the three visitors were gone. (laughs) Goodness. It's so interesting because this is one worker housekeeper here at this hotel and she's had all of these incredible experiences probably a tad sensitive even though she might not want to be (laughs) i'm wondering because these are like if you see a full-bodied apparition once in your lifetime that's amazing and she's just seeing them left and right here haunted hotels are the best places to rent a room and they sure are fun to investigate are people really seeing the ghost of a little girl at the hotel are there spirits hovering near the beds Does the elevator really have a mind of its own? Is the Lord Baltimore Hotel haunted? That is for you to decide. Sounds like a great hotel to stay at when you're in Baltimore. Absolutely. Just look at the pictures on the inside. They have refurbished it back to its former glory, and it's really something to see. And the outside is so cool, too, with these those two towers that are kind of out towards the front and then the larger octagonal towers towards the back. So I see how they're talking about it being a U-shape. And then it has that top on it, the mansard top that's all patinaed out and it just looks so cool. want to invite you guys to check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We did hear from Melissa And I had actually forgotten she had sent this back in September. This was right after she had listened to the latest episode that we had dropped at that point. And that was Nashville's Belmont Mansion. And she said, I had to stop the car and write this little email to you. You just so happened to mention Mary Martin, Peter Pan. Right as I was driving through through Weatherford, Texas, which just so happens to be the birthplace of Mary Martin. It's also the hometown of her son, Larry Hagman, who played Jer Ewing on Dallas who graduated from Weatherford High School. Who killed JR? Yeah, I remember that. I was in fourth grade. Isn't it funny, a TV show? And I can remember like where I was. Anyway, that little tidbit of information doesn't have much to do with the episode itself, but I thought it was odd that you start talking about her right as I'm in her hometown. No, it's not odd. It's just synchronicity, which happens all the time around here. All the synchronicities. And Melissa's been with us for many years, so she knows and this isn't the first bit of synchronicity we've had with her either. I want to thank you guys for joining us on this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode is brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Cindy Moss for raising her support. We're going to be moving her into a garden crypt. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us.